multiple sources, the real story. Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer was with us last week to talk about his book, Operation Dark Heart, which alleges shocking errors in the conduct of American intelligence operations. Now the colonel is going even further, alleging a cover-up at the highest levels of our government surrounding 9-11. Colonel Anthony Schaefer joins me now. Colonel, welcome back. Thank just you, just to set the picture, you are career military, now retired. You were in charge of a group of military intelligence officials overseas called Able Danger. Part of their responsibility was to find out who knew what, when, where the bad guys were, where the Taliban was, where Al-Qaeda was. At some point after 9-11, you met with the director of the 9-11 Commission. Who was he? Where did you meet him? What did he say to you? I was actually working at Bagram Air Force Base as undercover, working uh, as part of uh, the project in the book, Operation right. Darkheart. I met Dr. Philip Zelikow in mid-October 2003. Okay. During that session, I disclosed the existence of Able Danger plus another operation which related to Able Danger directly, which was going to be an, the real mission for my unit to go in and do some things to the Al-Qaeda uh, threat. That okay, we Philip Zelikow, Dr. Zelikow, now a professor at the University of Virginia, at the time was the staff director for the 9-11 Commission, Correct. Right? right? We are after 9-11 in the story you're telling me. Right. Zelikow and his team are in Iraq interrogating you and others about what you knew, mm -hmm. when you knew it, and whether you're going to tell this to the 9-11 Commission. He was in a Afghanistan. Judge. Okay, Afghanistan. And, and Bagram, and yes, he was. Okay, go ahead. And the idea was that they were on this fact-finding mission trying to figure out what intelligence was available to help fill in the missing gaps relating to the failures before 9-11. I volunteered to my Army chain of command and said, they may already know about this. As a matter of fact, they probably do. But just in case they don't, here's a one-page summary of what I want to talk to them about, and I'd like to give them the background on Able Danger. All right, you have given me a copy of that summary. You have given me a copy of your notes of your conversation with uh, Professor Selikow. Yes. And one of the things says, I'm quoting this directly, Colonel, CIA undermined subsources. What does that mean? This is where we're in a gray area by the fact the Pentagon, I've testified to this fact, and now the Pentagon's pulled it back out, which you need to ask, why would the Pentagon pull something out which is now 10 years old, which was, was actually my original testimony? What is it? Well, the, the issue has to do with a, a, an asset that we were using for the actual spearhead of the April Day uh, project. When you say an asset, you mean a human being providing you information about the bad guys? That's correct, yes, okay. sir. Okay, what became of that human being? Well, in this particular operation, one of the reasons I reported it to Dr. Zelikow as part of the Able Danger project, he was going to be used to, to do some what we call black operation support for this project. What happened was CIA protested his operational existence because they were at the time running a parallel operation called out of Alex base and because of that conflict supposedly uh, CIA went to Congress and said this guy's bad he killed his wife he actually they're not talking about you they're talking about the asset, talking about the asset. A person in yeah. Afghanistan yeah they used the excuse of, of that he that he supposedly killed his wife and ran drugs which most people All right. did, did this guy time. provide you and the defense intelligence agency for which you worked the Pentagon with actionable information he was consistently doing it yes he was consistently doing it and the CIA wanted him neutralized because he was your asset and not theirs that's is correct. That fair that is correct All right. did Michael Scheuer know anything about this judge I honestly don't know I know that during the able danger ramp up I met with I'll, I'll just call him David, who was the CIA rep to Special Operations Command, where I briefed him on Able Danger and said, we want access to what we were aware of, Alex Base, and what they were doing. We asked for access, and we, and we were told, if you get the information and you're successful and we're not, you'll take credit, we won't right. get credit. When you we met with David, he called you Chris. Do you guys always use undercover names even when you're dealing with each other? No. Not, not normally. Okay, but sometimes you do. Sometimes. Okay, now, when you came back to the United States and wanted to tell the 9-11 Commission that the CIA had squelched you from dealing with this asset, this human being, right. what happened? Well, it, it, was a, it was like the twilight zone. After the initial disclosure, Dr. Zelikow came to me at the end of the meeting, gave me his card and said, what you said today is, is critically important, very important. Please come see me when you return to Washington, D.C. I returned to Washington, D.C. January of 2004, call in, they say, we want to see you, stand by, nothing happens, a week goes by, I call again, they say, we don't need you to come in, we, we have all the information on Able Danger, we need, thank you anyway. 
And that was where it ended. All right, so the information that you told Dr. Zelikow in Afghanistan about the CIA interfering with your ability to provide actionable intelligence to the United States government, intelligence that might have helped them find out who caused 9-11, uh, you right. were not permitted to testify about it. That's correct. Okay. Did you ever have a conversation with anybody on the 9-11 commission, any one of the actual yes. commissioners, about what you knew, when you knew it, what he knew, and when, when he knew it? Uh, in September of 2005, 2005, um, I met with one of the members of the 9-11 Commission in Philadelphia. I had a, a lunch with him, and during this lunch, I provided to him all the background that we're talking about now and in greater detail. During that meeting, he confirmed to me that he had never heard any of this, and had he heard of it, it would have been something that was very much of interest to he and the Commission. All right, at the time you met with this 9-11 uh, Commissioner in uh, Philadelphia in 2005, correct right. me on my dates, the 9-11 report, that 500-page monstrosity that a lot of us, certainly in this business, read, had it been published yet? It had been published in that, yes. Okay, so it was published without the benefit of what you knew. Right. Did you ask him at, at that lunch meeting in Philadelphia whether or not anybody on the 9-11 Commission had an agenda or was covering up for somebody or was protecting somebody? The, the essence I, I received, and I asked that question directly about what the nature was of why they did, you know, what was the focus of the commission. And during that conversation, this commissioner said flat out that everybody on the commission was covering for someone. Now, let, let, me, let me hear that again. Everybody on the commission, you mean the commissioners themselves, was covering for someone. That was the way I interpret that statement. Yes. What do you pay attention, pay attention. Oh, I did. And, and Everybody was, was covering for we, somebody we else. The Jamie Gorelick issue. The, the number of the commissioners, to include this one, felt that Jamie Gorelick would, should never have been on a commission because of some of the causal uh, actions and effects of her actions right. within the context of the Jamie Gorelick was a deputy attorney general in the Clinton administration on the 9-11 commission during the Bush administration. While she was in the Clinton administration, she basically said to intelligence, you can't talk to law enforcement. That's correct. law enforcement, you can't talk to intelligence. That's correct. That was the problem the with wall memo. Yes, sir. Okay. Were, were, were members of the 9-11 commission, did they each have their own agenda, according to your friend on the commission? That's correct. Everybody had some issue they were looking at for some someone else. Wow. So there's a lot of things that never made it in that 9-11 report. Judge, that is the bottom line. And I think it's been revealed over and over for the past, past, past two years that things were either by negligence left out or, and I believe, by purpose left out. All right. Switching gears, before I go to Michael Scheuer, who's standing by listening to the conversation you uh, and I are having. Earlier this week in Lower Manhattan, uh, a federal judge prevented the government from presenting evidence from a critical witness because the identity of the witness was learned under torture. In your experience in military intelligence, does torture, which some people call enhanced interrogation, does the uh, intentional infliction of extreme pain to get somebody to speak, whatever you want to call it, does it work? Does it produce accurate, actionable intelligence? Let me speak to my experience. My experience is, no, it doesn't. I think you're much better off trying to figure out what makes that person tick for any number of reasons. There's a number of techniques which work very well. Uh, ego up, ego down, there's a, a range of them. Frankly, if you torture someone, Judge, they're going to tell you what you want to know, what they think you want to know, and make you go away. That has been an issue for years. And I do strongly support the Army's position on this, that we should, we should use techniques which actually work, rather than going into this what the so-called torture issue. I'm not saying I would never torture. I'm not saying there's no circumstance I would ever, that would ever present itself that I wouldn't do something like that. However, my experience so far to date has never required me to think of using that as an extraordinary method. But the military manual doesn't permit torture, and you took an oath to uphold it. That's, that's correct. Okay. Colonel Schaefer, thank you very much. The colonel is making stunning and direct allegations. Michael Scheuer was at the CIA as the lead bin, hot bin Laden hunter before 9-11. He responds next. All right, you just heard my explosive interview with Colonel Anthony Schaefer, and so did my next guest, who was firmly in the crosshairs of some of these allegations. Here to respond to Colonel Schaefer is Michael Scheuer, who served in the CIA for 22 years and was the head of the bin Laden unit between 1996 and 1999. Michael, you've been here before. It's always a pleasure. Welcome back to Freedom Watch. You, you, you heard sir. my questions to Colonel Schaefer, and you heard yeah. his answers. Was he right? Was he wrong? Was he somewhere in between? Well, I, I think we need to divide it into a couple of areas, Go ahead. Judge. Um, in terms of did the military have access, I can only speak to the time that I was uh, in charge of operations. We had 
uh, always two to three U.S. military personnel sitting in our spaces, in our, in our desk, reading everything that came in uh, up and down the line, and their job was to share it with the Department of Defense. I don't know why the information didn't get to uh, uh, the colonel and his group, although I have to say I didn't know of the existence of Able Danger at that time. Uh, but, uh, you know, the idea that the CIA didn't share information is, is just absurd. I had FBI officers, for example, taking thousands of pages of classified information out of our spaces right. uh, illegally well, would, and, would, and would using Would the CIA them. have done what Colonel Schaefer has suggested it did, and that is uh, ask the military to nullify or neutralize a human being who was providing intelligence because the CIA wanted to use its intelligence source rather than the defense intelligence agency's source? Uh, it didn't happen during my watch, sir. It may have happened later, but it doesn't sound like something that we would do to the Congress. But w even with the brief description of the source that the colonel provided, I know exactly who he's talking about. And for my sins, I have been involved in following that individual since the mid-1980s. He's still very prominent in Afghan affairs, but he's a, a liar of the first order. Uh, we used to deal with him, and he never provided a piece of good information about anything. But you're not talking about Colonel lies. Schaefer. You're talking about the guy in Afghanistan. Yes, the, the person that he described as, a, as someone who killed his wife and a narcotics traveler and all that, all right, all well, that stuff. Would the sir. CIA go to the 9-11 Commission and say, don't let this guy Schaefer testify because his source is all wet, or would the CIA not get involved? We would not get involved. We would not necessarily know what he was talking about, sir, but what, what the colonel is absolutely correct on is that the 9-11 Commission and the commissioners themselves were just there to whitewash it. They were blessed with the most brilliant staff you could imagine. But as commissioners, they were clearly there to not let the American people know what happened before 9-11. Well, was the 9-11 Commission report a whitewash, as Colonel Schaefer says, and as one of the 9-11 commissioners to whom he spoke, and you heard him talk about this person, pretty much agrees? It was a whitewash and a lie from top to bottom. What do you mean uh, a lie from top judge. to bottom, Michael? Well, in my own case, sir, uh, the, the agency officers who were involved before 9-11 in chasing bin Laden decided that we could not uh, simply testify under oath without providing supporting documentation. And so all of us uh, uh, both testified under oath. I did, I think, three times right. and provided documents. And is, I, I provided myself, let me speak just for myself here, Judge. I provided a three-inch binder with over 400 pages of, of documentation, not my notes, but official government documents right. about the failures before 9-11. I never heard one word back from Zelico. And I, and I approached Zelico. He asked me for the notebook. I told him it was available. He asked me for it. And he never got in touch to talk about right, one you, page you, you of obviously, material. You obviously know what was in the loose leaf. And I know you read the 9-11 Commission report. Did anything from the loose leaf make it its way into the final report? Nothing that would have been um, uh, uh, astounding. Uh, um, let, me, let me retrace that, sir. Not the important stuff. The important stuff did not. The failure of George Tenet, for example, to impose order on the intelligence community. Okay. The failure of the President of the United States to kill Osama bin Laden. The, the, all the important things uh, were not reflected in that. Before I let you go, report. you say that you agree with Colonel Schaefer that members of the 9-11 Commission were covering up for other people. For whom were they covering up, in Michael Scheuer's opinion? Both parties, sir. There was such endemic failure in the, in the Republican administration under Bush, but especially the Democratic uh, uh, administration under Clinton, that I'm very sure they felt that the American people would be shocked by the, by the negligence of its political uh, officers, of, its, of the people it elected to office. Uh, I personally talked to Zelico several times, to a guy named Ben Venista a couple times. Right. They all seemed very interested in what you had to say, but at the end of the day, it didn't make it into the report. All right. Thank you very much, Michael. We will ask Dr. Professor, former Staff Director Philip Zelikow uh, to come on the show next week.
and to see what, listen to what he has to say about these allegations. Colonel Schaefer, uh, Michael Shore, thanks for joining us. You say you want a revolution? Okay. Our next guest says it may be happening in about.